Well, the last few days were quite the roller coaster ride, weren't they? And to be honest, there were a lot of moments where I had to go and clean up the coke spit from my screen. Well, not literally, but figuratively, of course. But seriously, there were a lot of surprises in Pokemon Black and White. So this is basically my own review of what we've learned in these last few days, and you know me, I'm not one for straight-up reviews, there always has to be a gimmick. So today, I present to you the top 12 spit-take moments from Pokemon Black and White. Well, I say top 12, but in fact, there's a dishonorable mention. I'm mentioning it because, well, it sort of belongs here, but it's not going to have some serious long-term impact. I'm talking, of course, about the cease and desist to Cerebi and Poke Beach. Now, as you may know, Nintendo sent a notice to the Cerebi and Poke Beach webmasters asking them to put up, to stop putting up, rather, images of black and white on their sides. Why? It's free publicity! I mean, it's not copyright infringement at all, if you ask me. Every other site does it, which is sort of a wonder. You gotta wonder why only Cerebi and Poke Beach. Some people have suggested that this is their retaliation for the whole Victini saga that took place back in July, but still, come on. On copyright infringement, I'm pretty sure that falls under fair use. I'm not a lawyer, so I'm not sure if they even had a case, but I guess Cerebi and Water Pokemon Master didn't want to have extra trouble with them and willingly took down their pictures and all the sprites as well, which you can find on every other site, like for example, Psypokies, Vcon, stuff like that. All those sites didn't get cease and desist. And, uh, I'm sorry, I can't get over the fact that they are actually turning down free publicity for their games. Where's Fox News when you need them? They could, they're scandalized at every little thing that goes on in the gaming world, so why not here? And yes, I just implied that Fox News could potentially be useful for something. I'm going to take a long, cold shower after finishing this, I promise. Alright, now let's get into our top 12 proper. The first item on the list at number 12 is opposite defense moves, or rather, moves that run off an attack stat, but use the opposite defense in the damage calculation. I'm going to show you an example and you will know exactly what I mean. This is Psycho Break. This is Mewtwo's signature move. Yeah, after all these years, it was about time Mewtwo got a signature move to call his own. Anyway, 100 power, 100 accuracy, you can already see this is a very impressive move right off the bat. Special Psychic because, of course, hey, it's Mewtwo. If there's anything Mewtwo excels at, it's freaking Special Psychic. But the catch here is that it hits through physical defense. Now what makes this especially interesting is that in Ubers, most Pokémon have a lower physical defense stat than special defense. So not only is it more powerful than Psychic, but it's also going to hit through the lower defense many, many, many times, making Mewtwo definitely one of the most potent powerhouses of the upcoming Uber metagame. There is also another move that's absolutely identical to this, except it has 80 power instead of 100, and the catch with this one, Psycho Shock, is that it's actually a TM, which means that every Psychic type will learn it along with some assorted non-Psychic types that typically have very large move pools. Nonetheless, I think maybe this is what the Psychic type needed to get back on top. Types like Bug and Rock have their brutally overpowered moves like U-Turn and Stealth Rock, but maybe Maybe this is Psychic's answer to those other types when it comes to things that no other types can do. I really hope it turns out that way at least. Well, I say no other type. There's another type that learns that kind of moves. It's the fighting type with an attack called Skin Sword with 85 power. But the very interesting quirk about this move is that no one learns it, believe it or not. No one learns it by Egg Move. 
No one learns it by level up, and of course, it's not a TM. So, what is it? What is going to happen with this move? We'll actually come back to it later on, so don't worry about that. Number 11. The lack of fodder. This was a process that began in Generation 4, when, if, if you noted back then, even discarding the, the new evolutions to old Pokémon for a minute, you could notice that there were very, very few really weak Pokémon. There were like the likes of Pachirizu, Wormadam, Mothim, Cherim, stuff like that. But here, it's even better! The only one that I would call absolute and complete trash is Miruhogu. Yeah, because it doesn't really have very good abilities, unlike its predecessor, Bibarel. But still, even the likes of Kokoromori and Bazurao are salvaged by excellent abilities. And on that note, Game Freak clearly tried to make some Pokémon useful by using EXTREME stat spreads on them. If you look at the list of base stats for each Pokémon, you're going to see a lot of stats that are above 130. You got, for example, Maman Boo's HP, um, you also got the Shandera's special attack, and, well, there are a lot of other examples like that, I'm not gonna mention them all, but it really seems like Game Freak was out to make every Pokémon as good as humanly possible. Except for Miruhogu, of course. That thing just sucks. Number 10. Odd-looking Pokémon. Every generation has got them. It's not because Generation 1 was the first that it was exempt from that, but still, Generation 5 has quite possibly the quirkiest of them. The one on the left, you know, I don't really know what to think of it, actually. It looks like... it looks like an aborted Blaziken. No, really, look at it! That's what it looks like! Please kill me! And then you got an ice cream cone? Really? <laughs> and, of course, everyone's favorite, not really, the garbage bag that evolves into... Uh, well, a torn garbage bag with garbage pouring out of every orifice. I actually sort of like this one because I think there aren't nearly enough comical relief Pokémon. You got, like, Bidoof and this, and that's about it. So I like seeing something that's not completely serious every once in a while. Number 9. Unused Moves. There are quite a few. I've already mentioned the Skin Sword, but there are a few others that absolutely nothing gets. And people have got their own idea as to who it belongs to, but please note that this isn't the first time this happens, because in Generation 3, Vault Tackle was in the game code starting with Ruby and Sapphire, but no one learned it in Ruby and Sapphire. No one learned it in Fire Red and Leaf Green. It wasn't until Emerald that Pikachu and Raichu got it. And so, yeah, there's a precedent for that. And, okay, let's take a look at those unused moves and see why they haven't been distributed yet. First, we got V-Generate, which is rumored to belong to Victini. And as you can see, it's probably for the best that it doesn't have have it quite yet. 180 power! 95 accuracy, of course, it's physical fire, and it, it lowers speed, defense, and special defense by one stage, which makes it the perfect tactic for a hit and run, because of course if you're using V-Generate, you're not planning on keeping your Victini on the field in the long run. And the other two moves no one has are both rumored to belong to QRM. Both have 140 power and 90 accuracy. One of them is physical ice, it's called Freeze Bolt, and it has a 30% chance of paralysis and apparently no drawback. Not even the same one as Draco Meteor, like someone would have expected since it has the same power and accuracy. And the other one is called Cold Flare. Same power, same accuracy, except this one is special and has a 30% chance of burn. Yeah, an ice move that burns. Well, we already got a water move that burns with boiling water, so why not this? And you know what? Maybe those two super-powered moves are the explanation why Kiremu doesn't have the same 
stat total as every other version mascot out there. Because everything other than Kyuremu from Mewtwo all the way to Reshiram and Zekrom have 680, but Kyuremu has only 660. Maybe because they decided to give it super-powered moves of doom instead. Number 8. Extreme Evolution Levels. Prior to this generation, the only Pokémon that evolved past level 45 were pseudo-legendaries. Well, they decided to mix things up a little, because prior to this generation, the highest evolution level belonged to Vibrava into Flygon at level 45, but here, tons of Pokémon are way past 45 when they finally evolved. Let's take a look at them. First, we got Gigear into Gigagear at level 49, Onondo into Ononokusu at level 48, Kojofu into Kojondo at level 50, Komatana into Kirikizan at level 52, Washiban into Wargle at level 54, Baruchai into Barujina at level 54 as well, and Meraruba into Urugamosu at level 59. Now, what's really weird about that last one is that you get both a Meraruba egg in the game, as well as a level 75 Urugamosu that you can catch like any other legendary, despite the fact that it's not actually a legendary. So this is a rather weird one. And now you must be asking, what about the pseudo-legendary? Surely the levels are absolutely horrible. Well, they are. Monozu evolves into Jihedo at level 50, which is later than when Metang evolves into Metagross. It's later than when Gabite evolves into Garchomp. And here we got a Pokémon with a base stat total of 300, evolving into a Pokémon with a base stat of 420 at level 50. And Jihedo evolves into its final form, the Hydra Sazando, at level 64. That is late. Of course, using any of those Pokémon for in-game runs is, of course, not recommended. Unless, of course, you want to take on the Elite Four with an unevolved Washibon. Well, then that is your own choice. Number 7. Reshiram and Zekron. Of course, high hopes were put upon them through their abilities Turbo Blaze and Terra Voltage, but unfortunately those abilities ended up being fairly underwhelming. They're basically Mold Breaker clones. Not that Mold Breaker is such a bad ability, but if you're going to give it a clone of an ability that already exists, don't make such a big deal about it, or better yet, just give them Mold Breaker! It's not like every legendary that gets pressure gets pressure under a different name. God knows there are a lot of these. Even Kyuremu was an exam from this. But that doesn't mean the entrance of Reshiram and Zekrom was a boring one. Nope, we got a few surprises in the form of their signature moves. Each one has two of them. We already knew about Cross Flame and Cross Thunder, but it's the other ones that really caught everyone's attention. Reshiram's move is called Blue Fire, 130 power, 85 accuracy, special fire, and 20% chance of a burn. Now, I know what you're thinking. Doesn't it look as just as cheap as Sacred Fire or Sea Flare? Yes. Yes, it is. But I guess that was the entire point. And as for Zekrom's move, it's nearly identical except it's physical, electric, it has a chance of paralysis, and it's called lightning. Yeah, I know you're wondering why a move called lightning is physical. Well, my theory is that it's simply because Zekrom's highest attacking stat is physical and they wanted Zekrom's special moves to actually match those attacking stats. 